<clears throat> so this is the pre-class video for class number 18, RPH 140 World Philosophies. Uh, the class for Thursday, uh, July 29th. Um, and it's, we're going to finish up with Buddhism and we're going to start with Islam. Um, so yesterday we had four and a half people gone. So uh, we're going to start with Mary Hannah, Caitlin, Michael, Jason, and Lackenzie talking about Buddhism. Um, we can even go back way to the beginning because the theme of comparing Buddha to Jesus and the problem with religious establishments, right? So the Hindus became the establishment religion. Buddha was born into Hinduism but he was fed up with its corruption. He spoke out against it and he eventually left and developed what became a new religion. Um, doesn't mean that that's really what he had in mind at the beginning, but that's what happened. Then um, I will show some slides of Buddhist uh, after everyone has reacted to the section on Buddhism, we talked about Buddhism and women, Buddhism and the environment. I had a paper by a student um, called Buddha and Prophet and Proverbs. So just FYI, for your comments on your posts, when you read a paper like this, it's a student who is a lion student that grew up around Baptist churches. And after reading the wisdom of the Buddha, he came to realize that both the Bible and this book have many of the same teachings. So, um, so he, his, the focus of his paper um, are, is, Wisdom, foolishness, evil, punishment, happiness, pleasure, and anger. And by this time in the class, he's read, you know, Aristotle on anger, Aristotle on temperance. Um, but he also now is very familiar with the Old Testament, Proverbs. And then he read Wisdom of the Buddha. So he compares them. So on your post, what you ought to do is not just pick out an isolated quote. You need to sort of big picture. Um, what did you think about this paper? Can you identify with the student who wrote it? Can you say, oh, he saw a lot of similarities and I'm seeing a lot of similarities also. And he picked out these issues and I can understand what he's saying there. I thought of the same thing, or my first thoughts were these other virtues or these other comparisons. So I would like you to just get um, deeply engaged, engaged with the whole reading, with the context of the reading, in the context of what we read before. And then the end of each post is supposed to be your final takeaway. So. Um, so I want you to shift between just picking out isolated quotes, or if you pick out a quote, connect it to a lot of other things, right? So I'm talking about how each of my readings is about patterns in human affairs. Um, and I talked about that in the last pre-class video. So I would like you to do that in your reactions. Um, so let's see, then we had Christian interiority. He said, comment on 
the secularism of contemporary society, I would say the influence of capitalism. Um, but, you know, to what extent uh, have we lost a meaningful humanism, whether it's spiritual humanism, secular humanism, whatever, but we're just not developing the virtues. And greed, which undermines all the virtues, is really um, uh, a huge force in our society. And then to what extent do our phones destroy any kind of interiority, <laughs> humanistic or any kind of humanism and any kind of religious humanism, not just Christian humanism? Um, so I would like you to reflect a little on that. Um, then I'm going to show you some Zen Buddhist art and read from the wisdom of the Buddha. I think I had that on the um, pre-class video last time. And I'll show you some more slides. And I want you to notice the view of reality in Buddha in Buddhism, and then how the, the pictures, the art, really does show that view of reality. You don't think about it when you're in an art museum and you sort of walk into a room and, oh, this is Zen Buddhist art, and walk into another room and, oh, this is Hindu art. But, you know, if you, if you take philosophy, if you read a little bit, you can understand what the artists are doing they're trying to get you in touch with the Atman. And um, you, can, you can think about whether that's effective. When you go to an art museum, I recommend that you spend time meditating. All right, so Buddhism and Hinduism are mystical religions. They focus on contemplation, meditation, they focus on trying to get you to clear your mind, right? Get it in touch with the universe. There's brain studies to show that they really do succeed in shutting down certain parts of the brain and opening up other parts. Um, so now we're gonna cover Islam. <coughs> and Islam, Christianity, and Judaism are the religion of the book. And so they refer to a holy book. And so these religions can get caught, caught up much more in doctrine. And you have to be very careful that people aren't um, using the doctrine to actually behave in wicked ways or just to fail to act virtuously because they've convinced themselves that they're virtuous just because of something they believe, not because of the way they act or how they feel or um, why they do what they do. That's purity of heart. That's what Jesus was worried about. And that's what Muhammad was worried about also. So for Thursday, we probably won't get through all this material in this um, post, but we'll do, we will start. I do want you to read the chapter on Islam. Um, the people who are secular humanists, spiritual humanists, Hindus, Buddhists, Confucian, they look at the Christians, Jews, and Muslims and say, look, you guys, you're cousins. Like, why do you fight so much? Why do you beat each other up so much? You're a lot more alike than different. Um, and then the Houston Smith talks about Buddha's, uh, Muhammad's life. He was also poor, orphaned. Um, he lived in Mecca and Mecca was very corrupt and he was disgusted by public life. So he isolated himself. 
Jesus saw a lot of corruption. He got baptized. He went up in the wilderness and thought about it. He came back with this redeeming message. Buddha saw a lot of corruption. He left it all. He meditated under the bow tree. And he came back with a redeeming message, right? Redemption, getting back to a spiritual life. Um, so he owned a caravan business. He worked for a woman 15 years older than him. She was his first disciple, and they were married for 15 years. Later on, he had more wives because Islam allows for four wives, and that sounds terrible to us. Um, but, and there are plenty of Muslims at this point who say, well, there's no more reason. There was a reason to have up to four wives because if women didn't marry, their parents didn't want to take care of them and, and they couldn't provide for themselves. So it, you know, it's just a survival thing made into a, a respected custom. Now, Muhammad insisted that each wife have a decent standard of living and a separate place to live. So he was really much more progressive about women than um, the culture at the time and that men at the time. He was advanced. Um, just like Gandhi was tried to break down all those roles between men and women between the untouchables. They, they try to break down class barriers, gender barriers, race, ethnicity. All of them try to do that. Um, so Muhammad joined this group of people that used to go up on the mountain and on retreats. And um, this particular group uh, accepted or had a worldview with one God. Allah, um, and he became a member, and then he had his, his night of power. This was his conversion experience, and the book, the Quran, was opened up to Muhammad. So the angel Gabriel, this is the, the theory, you know, the story, the angel Gabriel came to him and he went back to his wife she was his first convert and it was a series a number of different revelations he had and he wrote down the quran but he distinguished between the interior quran like jesus said i will write the law on their hearts it's not about orthodoxy doctrine ritual, tradition. It's about writing the law on your heart. Buddha, it's about getting in touch. It's about liberation. And for Muhammad, there's the interior Quran, and then there's the one that's written down. The one that's written down can be corrupted by people. Um, it can even be corrupted by a person who thinks they're following it, but they're not. Um, so what about his ministry? So Jesus had a conversion experience, had a ministry. Buddha did the same. Martin Luther King, you know. Uh, Gandhi had those two experiences of racism. He changed his life and started to be an activist. Over and over again, this happens. So when I teach college students, I just plant seeds. At the end of your 20s, something I think will come to you. I don't, might not be the angel Gabriel, <laughs> but something, some direction I think in life that makes sense to you, that's meaningful to you. Um, he didn't pander to, to the miracle hundred, right? He didn't say, I'm, you know, the great spirit and get followers who blindly followed him. He kept telling people to change their lives, to turn around, to purify their hearts. 
He didn't inflate his own importance. He was humble. Um, he focused on the, the creation itself is the biggest miracle. And it's ordered. And this led Muslims to science. Muslims were scientific long before the West. As a matter of fact, um, uh, well, okay, so Greece, the culture, intellectual culture of the Greeks got spread by Alexander into the Mideast. And then it got brought back through Southern Spain. And so, and it filtered up through Southern Spain. And that was when the West started to develop way, way later than the Mideast. So it's important that you understand that. Um, so the Quran is the only miracle. He reacted to the religious and political establishment. He threatened their standard beliefs. He threatened the money, the corruption coming into Mecca. So, you know, people would have pilgrimages and they'd have to pay money. And so these people aren't, religious leaders are making a ton of money. Martin Luther had that problem with the Roman Catholic Church. Uh, people were paying the last penny they had for indulgences. The church told them, you know, in order to spring your uncle from purgatory to heaven, you have to pay. And the church was getting really rich. So Muhammad could see through that corruption. Um, and he could see, you know, people were slothful, lust, sloth, Sloth, lust, greed, um, pride, all the degenerate behavior in general. And they also challenge the unjust social order, right? He's democratic. Um, first he was ridiculed, then he was persecuted, had to run away, just like Confucius. Jesus didn't run away. Socrates didn't run away. Martin Luther King didn't run away. What else is new? Gandhi, you know, nonviolent. He stood up, he got arrested. So he escaped. Um, the migration is called the Hedra. It was a turning point in their history. So that's where their calendar begins. Um, so Muhammad uh, made these transitions in life. He lived a long life. So he went from being a prophet to actually governing the society. He became a judge, a general, and a teacher. So his personal life was simple. He didn't have class consciousness. He tempered justice with mercy. He was forgiving. Uh, he wielded, uh, fused five tribes together into a city. Um, my, my students in Indonesia always talk about the charter of Medina. So long ago, long before, um, I think the Christian West, he had the Jews who lived in that area and, and the Christians, he gave them rights, protection, you know, the right to protection under the law. He gave them various equal rights. They couldn't build uh, a synagogue or a church. They couldn't build a religious building and they had to pay more taxes. But other than that, they were not persecuted, which was very progressive. Um, he conquered this whole huge area the Ottoman Empire. And Houston Smith, again, gives him the benefit of the doubt that the reason why he did wasn't because he was so brutal. It was because he brought order into this area where these countries were very disordered. So the quality of life went up after they'd been conquered, okay? 
Now, you know, I'm sure that was true of some places more than other places. Uh, same could be said for Alexander. Um, so, but that's sort of the main point there. Now, for next time, I don't think we're going to get this far, but okay, I'll talk a little bit about this. Uh, the Quran, um, the Muslims tend to read it literally, but um, so the Quran has a lot of the same stories as the Bible. It has Moses, has Abraham, Isaac, Moses, you know, Noah. It's amazing, really. Um, but it, it tells the story as one revelation from the angel Gabriel to Muhammad. So the Old Testament, New Testament, just flat out show that you have different authors and they have different concepts of God. So it's impossible to take it literally. You can say, you know, every word was inspired by God because the person writing this down was inspired by God. But the trouble is God inspired people to believe different things. Um, so um, Noah thought that if he ran away from where he thought God was located, he could run away from God, like God only had so much sonar. You know? And then Jeremiah, Jeremiah thought God went with the Jews when they were dispersed. So all of a sudden God is bigger, is more immaterial than that. Uh, Jesus thought God was mostly a loving God. Moses thought God, you know, so they, they all had different ideas and they had different life experiences. The person who wrote the Proverbs also had a midlife crisis and wrote Ecclesiastes. So the same author can change his relationship to God or change his mind about God and God's relationship to human beings. So it's a lot, you know, it's a lot more complex and problematic and historical than the Quran. Um, it, the belief is that the Quran is the final and infallible revelation and that Jesus died too soon. So the idea is that it's the same values, it's the same God, but Jesus died, he didn't get married, he didn't have a job, he didn't have kids. He didn't, what, didn't participate in any kind of political life. He wasn't any kind of leader, political leader, or business leader, or education leader. It wasn't at all related to institutions. He had trouble with the religious leaders and the religious institutions. But he himself never took on any of this stuff and dealt with them day to day. Um, so... So the idea of Islam is that God sent Muhammad to teach people and show people how to live the same values out in day-to-day -day life and in playing all these different roles, all right? Um, let's see. They all, the whole... All three of these religions, you know, proclaim the unity, the omnipotence, the omniscience, and the mercy of God. The books speak in a different voice, but it's the same message. Um, I know the Muslims that I met in Indonesia, they did memorize it quite a bit. And they really, really, it was very sacred. It was poetry when they read it. Uh, it was, this is hallowed ground, you know. So the basic theological concepts are um, Jesus was a prophet, but not God, right? And they, they think, you know, to say that the God, that God, God had a son is to them heresy or whatever. It's wrong. Um, they didn't 
they think of God as energy. There's no parental images because that's too anthropomorphic. That's too human centered. So they want to focus on immaterial God. Um, so th I think that's interesting. Christianity, you know, God not only is a person, God actually came to earth as a person, whereas the Hindu, the Buddhist, all these other ones, it's more of an energy. Um, God's nature. So there are way more quotes for God being merciful than God being angry and, and vengeant, right? Revengeful. Um, so God created the universe, and so the universe is good. So we should respect it. Um, God created humankind, which is fundamentally good, but they forgot their divine origin. And so the word infidel means ungrateful. You're not thankful. Um, your proper attitude should be gratitude. Islam means surrender. Um, there's personal responsibility. There's a day of judgment. So Islam and Christianity are just the two major religions that uh, focus on the judgment day after death, okay? Um, then there's the five pillars, and we'll talk about the five pillars, the social teachings, um, and the different types of Islam, and what's happening, right? And this book was written a long time ago, but one reason I have older books isn't just because I'm lazy. It's because people knew 70 years ago these things. It's not like they started yesterday. Um, and in some senses, they knew 2,500 years ago stuff that we think is some big revelation or some big recent historical trend. I find that super annoying because <laughs> it just is so ignorant and vain. <laughs> but um, the other thing that's kind of interesting is that Keith Ellison was elected to the US House and he was Muslim and he brought a Quran that he checked out from Thomas Jefferson's library. So Thomas Jefferson had a Quran because he wanted to understand the world's religions. Obviously, he wanted to understand Confucianism. He wanted to understand Islam. Um, so I think that's funny. The other thing about it is that my mother voted for him and he came from the part of the Minnesota where that was her representative. I knew him. My parents knew him personally because his son went to the same school that my nephew went to and um, they played on basketball team together. So I went to a couple games. But Keith Ellison more recently, he's the attorney general of Minnesota. He was in charge of the Derek Chauvin trial for the death of George Floyd. He and his team were the ones who got uh, ended up getting Mr. Chauvin a uh, 22 and a half year prison sentence. So um, yeah, it's kind of interesting how, you know, decades ago I knew about Keith Ellison and now he historically, you know, he's playing a role in history. Um, all right, so we will work on Islam. Then I had this chart about the same six issues, authority, rituals, speculation, tradition, grace, and mystery. And so now we compare Muhammad to the religious authorities of his day, Jesus, right, Buddha, <laughs> Martin Luther King, Gandhi. Um, it just goes on and on. And I invite you, actually, you can think about your own, you know, problems with authority where you feel like 
uh, the authorities were corrupt. They might have been ignorant, well intentioned. They might have been corrupt. They might have been too fundamentalist, like obsessed about literalism or uh, details, um, petty things when you really should be much more broad minded. Um, just various ways that any kind of moral compass can get corrupted. Um, I'll talk about cosmology and the, the question of creation, which I talked about with Hinduism, because now we have in Islam, they had a number of schools of thought about different understandings of the origins of the universe, but they follow very much along the same lines as Christianity. Then I don't think we're going to have time to get to actually reading the Quran. And then there are um, important um, articles in the New York Times, which I definitely want us to cover. And I'm not quite sure we're going to get it to it on Thursday or Friday, but definitely. So depending upon which day you'd have more time, um, I do want you to read those. And then these last two are about conversion experiences. So Muhammad had this big conversion experience, Jesus. Um, and this was Arjuna's in the Bhagavad Gita. That was how he, he turned around. And I had just that outline where I gave you page numbers from the Gita. And then Rudolf Otto talked about you know, all the religions, here's a pattern in the religions that people do have these experiences. But I'd say at 9-11, it was pretty revealing that these are not personal conversion experiences. They're what happens when there's an attack, right? 9-11 and how different preachers interpret it in different ways but it really does matter how it gets interpreted because um, we, we decided to take revenge and our political leaders fomented this vengeful attitude and we went after Saddam who did not do it, but we followed our leaders who had their own agenda for going after Saddam and the agenda was cheap oil. It wasn't, you know, promoting virtue or anything like that. But the American public was not educated enough to know that. And so we became the suckers and we're really suffering for that. Um, all right, so that's why these ideas from religious traditions they're not unrealistic. They're realistic. Religious stories about the desire for revenge or stories about the history of a religious tradition and how it gets corrupted and how redeemers, it comes along, it gets redeemed by certain special re redemptive characters. These things happen all the time. And they happen in your life at a milder degree, right? The rest of us are just sort of like watered down versions uh, compared to these great, you know, leaders. But yeah, we are who we are and we can identify. That's the, that's the stories are intended to be told in a way that readers can identify. So they pick the stories of Muhammad and Jesus. They, they write about them in a way that's supposed to, people can identify with. There's plenty of things in everybody's life that are idiosyncratic, eccentric, you wouldn't identify with. But there's other ways to tell the story of your life where people you're talking to will identify with it so you and i think you probably do that quite a lot without even thinking about it but our lives are like that 
we're similar and we're different than this or that, or this person or that person. We always think about that. But that's part of being human. Our common humanity is to have these instinctual drives and to try to process them and integrate them into a civilized life and in order to flourish and bond with other people, weave together society. It all, it all sort of meshes together. It's just that when someone comes along and says doctrine is more important, small petty things are more important, power is more money, and they can use rhetoric, use religious rhetoric, over and over again, it gets corrupted. So, um, so I will see you tomorrow, Thursday, and we will talk about these things.